I, I had I had three things, <laughs> but I've lost them all because I, I have to tell you now that this is the second time today I've stood up from a warm seat wishing I had a piece of paper in my hand. Oh my God! Uh, it goes downhill from here. It's hard to know why I was invited back after a beginning like that, isn't it? But I, I was. Several years ago, I was invited to deliver a speech at the ANU Medical Students Graduation Ball. And just like then, then just as now, I was delighted to say yes, and in exactly the same way, I had no idea what I was going to say. What I did on that occasion was took my wife's advice and simply told a few stories. Mostly, they were about what an appalling medical student I had been and how I was as surprised as my teachers to be graduating at all. In some ways, these were, these were funny stories and um, got a few laughs, mostly at my own expense. And I realized in preparing for this, this talk that the joke had been on, me, been on me. And so I'm really quite keen to make some jokes at other people's expense tonight. The medical profession is an easy target. It's, it's very easy to laugh at ourselves. And reflecting on this, I could think of no better examples than the famous duck hunting joke. For those of you who've heard it, I hope a few of these little personal embellishments are, are at least new. But the story goes like this. A whole lot of doctors go duck hunting, and I wish, I hope that you can picture the scene. Lots of them, shotguns at the ready walking over a barren field, and as they do so, the small airborne thing gets going from right to left across their field of view, and the GP looks up and says, hey, everybody, that's a duck. And of course, the neonatologist turns to the pediatrician and says, oh, cute, oh, cute. And the pediatrician says, that's fine, but I'd like to remind all those present that this is not simply a small adult duck. <laughs> The physician, who has a bent for neurology, looks at this thing and says, well, you know, at that altitude and at that flying velocity and from where I am standing, this has all the features in keeping with being a duck. However, I would like to rule out pheasant. I'd like to rule out quail. And turns to the radiologist and says, what do you think? The radiologist takes their time and pulls out an enormous pair of binoculars and scrutinizes this bloody thing at length and says, the images I have of what you refer to is in total keeping with duckliness. However, <laughs> this could be a, a hypertrophied sparrow and equally it could be an atrophied ostrich. And I think that somebody who's close to the creature should correlate clinically. <laughs> While all this is going on, the ED physician, newly arrived, and quite frankly no one knew why he was invited in the first place, <laughs> has shouldered the rifle and pulled off every shot that the magazine holds and missed with every single one. <laughs> and he turns around and he says, hey guys, do you reckon that was a duck? <laughs> I, I know, the surgeons got bored because quite frankly the attention span's fairly short. He turns to the anaesthetist and says, keep that thing still, I'm going to shoot it. The anaesthetist is either ignoring him or just hasn't heard because he's looking through the newspaper trying to find the pseudocu. <laughs> the surgeon blasts away anyway, somehow manages to hit it, it falls to the ground, and a couple of them turn to the intensivist and say, do you think you're going to be able to fix that? <laughs> and the intensivist says, well, I'm not sure I have capacity, and quite frankly, has anybody asked the, the, the duck what it would want under these circumstances? <laughs> no, I'm really sure, sure it wants this at all. Finally, the pathologist's seeking an end to this ongoing tragedy, walks over to this immobile feathered wreck and peers at it from a very, very close distance. And finally, two days later, pronounces inadequate specimen. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, Simon, you've left out a number of medical professions. And you would be correct. There are several groups which I've not made fun of. Most notably, orthopedic surgeons. You would think they were ripe for the picking, wouldn't you? You would think that I would have literally hundreds of jokes to choose from, and so I went looking. And I have to disappoint you now. In fact, it turns out there are only two jokes about orthopedic surgeons, and the rest are all true stories. <laughs> Up 
until this point, I've also left the mental health professionals alone, perhaps because of my innate fear of being psychoanalyzed myself. But if you hold this fear with me, I, I think you can relax. These people are easy to spot. If you are in a non-medical environment, all you need to do is wait for the most good-looking person to enter the room. The psychiatrist will be the person watching everybody else. If you're in a medical environment, the way you tell the mental health staff from the patients is that the patients will ultimately get a better and go home. <laughs> and, and the list goes on. The list goes on. Dermatologists are the ones covered in sunscreen. Infectious diseases physicians are those people who wash their hands before they go to the toilet. And neurosurgeons, let's just say, you don't need to be a brain surgeon to be a brain surgeon. So we are able to laugh at ourselves. And I think that that is good. I really do. But if you look carefully under these jokes, and if you look at what Shakespeare and Chaucer would have us believe, that in jest there, is many, there are many truths, perhaps we can think about just two of those this evening. The first is that perhaps we're not as confident, or perhaps as good as we think we are. There's just a little bit of concern in those jokes that perhaps we're not, we, we don't have it all together. And maybe, just maybe, we're all a little bit insular. As the Americans put it, we are want to stay in our lane and to stay in that part of the medical profession we've chosen for ourselves. I'm at a point now where I have studied and practiced medicine for longer than I haven't studied and practiced medicine. And I hope in that time that I have been a good doctor. That's not to say that good doctors make, don't make errors. I may be a good doctor and I may be a bad doctor, but I will tell you that I make mistakes. And they haunt me especially in the bitter watches of the night when the demons come. And the context here is important, isn't it? Because a hundred new doctors graduated yesterday. And I'd like to say that again, to be followed by a lot of applause. A hundred new doctors graduated yesterday. <laughs> I say to the graduates of tonight that while your training was no doubt better than mine, and I am confident that you graduate a better doctor than I was, I still to this day don't know what a good doctor is. If you had to ask every medical professional in this room what makes a good doctor, or stated perhaps another way, who is a good doctor, and who would you go to if a family member was sick, they would be able to tell you and they would be able to tell you quickly. What is fascinating is that they may not be able to tell you why. And I think that this is a crucial question. So what is it? Is it knowledge? That's gotta be a big factor, doesn't it? I went to medical school with students who would study for a blood test. Some of these people won medals and went on to be fantastic doctors. Others were lost to plastic surgery and medical administration. <laughs> Is it clinical skill? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> clinical skill, I don't know if I still have a job left after that joke. <laughs> Please, Bernadette. Um, if, is it clinical skill? Yes, clinical skill is an easy thing for us to admire. Could it be poise and calmness under pressure? Yes, on some days it might be. I'm reminded of Rudyard Kipling's famous poem, If. It's a beautiful poem. It starts, if you can keep your head while all those about you are losing theirs, and blaming it on you, and goes on to name many facets of what make up a truly whole human being. Now, I spend a lot of time working in acute care, and sometimes, if you can keep your head while all those about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, it's because you have seriously underestimated the situation. <laughs> and obviously, it's all of these things, isn't it? But there's something more. There's something more. The finest members of our profession that I've had the privilege to work with never fail to put the patient first. They always seem to have the capacity to ask themselves the question, what does this person need from me? Therefore, on some days, you will see them invest huge amounts of time in what looks like simple conversation. And on others, they will exercise incredible speed and skill, all the while 
promising their patient that today will not be the day that they die. So, if this is where we are today, and I know that we're graduating good doctors, getting better and better all the time, what about that other undercurrent? That perhaps we're all a little bit insular, and perhaps we spend too much time focusing only on our own, our own speciality, pardon me. Here, if you'll forgive me, I won't prognosticate, I'm bad at that, but I'd like to make a prediction I'd like to come true. As I said, not very good at prognostication, but here we go. I'd like medicine to evolve into a team sport. I really would. Right now, if I want to see teamwork, I've got to switch on the television and change over to a sports channel. If medicine does indeed evolve in such a way that we are better at the human factors, and that as doctors, we are able to integrate into teams and lead these teams. So if we've graduated people like yourselves, who then, as they develop in their career, become team players, who are truly patient focused, what I would say to you is that I can with confidence look around the room at the new graduates tonight, and confidently say that this vocation I and your colleagues hold dear is in very good hands. Graduates of 2018, your colleagues around the room and I congratulate you. We look forward to working with you and learning from you as your careers grow. Thank you very much.